Welcome to Omega Matters, where we talk all things Omegas. I'm Christina Jackson. This is Bill Harris. And today we are speaking with two research scientists from the University of Kansas Medical Center, Kathleen Gustafson and Danielle Cristofano. We came to know them through the work um, with Susan Carlson's lab, who we've interviewed before, studying DHA in pregnancy. Um, Kathleen was the director of the Neurophysiology Core at the Hogland, Hugland Brain Imaging Center at the University of Kansas Medical Center until she recently retired. And she has expertise in neurophysiologic measurements, vision, retina, signal processing, and has collaborated on several nutrition studies. She also holds two patents related to human retinal dystroph dystrophin and two patents related to the nutritional needs of premature infants. Dr. Cristofano, or Danielle, is an assistant professor in the Department of Nutrition and Dietetics, where she studies the influence of nutrition on neurophysiological outcomes in mothers and children using te techniques available at the Hoagland um, Imaging Center. And she is also ha has a keen interest in improving the accessibility of prenatal nutrition recommendations, including omega-3 in clinical settings. So we are very excited to talk to you now that I've gotten through the intro. <laughs> so thank you guys for um, talking with us today. Thank you um, for yes. So first, can you each talk a little bit about your background and what brought you to where you are today in terms of your, your work? Sure. You want me to start? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, it's, it's a little bit lengthy, but I'll try to keep it short. So my original interest was in uh, infant vision development and retinal function. And uh, my, my uh, mentor, Gerhard Sebus, is a pediatric ophthalmologist, and he was invited to collaborate in one of the Dobbing conferences that was held in Adelaide, Australia. And at the last minute, he couldn't go, so he just kind of tossed me on a plane and said, take it away. <laughs> Yeah. And that was my first introduction to the, the entire fatty acid world. And that's where I met Susan Carlson and Bob Gibson and Martha Nuringer and, and uh, many others who've had uh, great influence on this field and my career. Mm -hmm. So afterwards, because of our expertise in uh, measuring infant vision, we ended up uh, participating in several uh, large scale clinical trials. And I was all along very skeptical about the influence of DHA and, and infant vision development, but it wasn't until we did a multi-site study uh, where we used both electrophysiological and, and behavioral methods of uh, visual assessment in infants that I was convinced that DHA definitely had a role um, in infant vision development. Mm -hmm. So, um, but nonetheless, I wanted to pursue dystrophin in the retina and find out what that was all about. We were working with transgenic mice and, and uh, very basic science, but um, I kept getting pulled in this direction um, to study, you know, the influence of fatty acids. So uh, we kept getting involved in more and more trials and, and the group of people in this field are so interesting and fun to work with that they eventually uh, charmed me into their field and away from retina. And uh, here I am today. So we're not only colleagues, but good friends. How That's long have you been at KU? Uh, almost 20 years. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's 20 years, years, 20 years at the University of Missouri Children's Mercy Hospital and 20 years at KU. Wow. Oh, I can yeah. did the reverse. I did, I did 11 years at KU Med and 11 years at St. Luke's. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> the same Lip -flop. Time. <laughs> yeah, people ask me if I had to move when I, when I uh, went to KU. And it's like, no, just turn left instead of right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's so oh, yeah. much good stuff in Kansas City. That's right. Yeah. Um, Danielle, how about you? Yeah, so um, my educational background is in biomedical and nutrition sciences, but I would say my interest in maternal and infant nutrition started about 14 years ago when I had the opportunity to live and work in Southeast Asia. So during my time there, I had the chance to work with children, refugee populations who were just in dire need of micronutrient repletion. And this was like the first time I saw firsthand the power of nutrition. And I was like, I need more. I need to know more now. And so I started applying for grad programs and from there went on to pursue a master's and PhD in medical nutrition sciences at KU Medical Center. 
I had the honor and privilege of working with Dr. Susan Carlson, um, you know, a true pioneer in omega-3 research for my master's thesis, and then went on to pursue a PhD in something a bit different. I was doing weight management in breast cancer survivors, but I missed maternal and fetal medicine so much. Mm -hmm. And that's when I found Kathleen. So shortly after finishing my PhD, I was introduced to Kathleen who was doing this incredible work linking fetal electrophysiology to nutrition and studying omega-3 fatty acids and DHA. And I was like, I need more of this. This is exactly what I want to pursue in my career. And so something about Kathleen's passion and incredible knack for teaching, she's an incredible teacher. Mm -hmm. It really allowed me to pick up something totally new, which is electrophysiology. <laughs> and so I started learning about all these electrophysiological measures and how it can be really a biomarker of health not just in the fetus, but in adults too. And so here I am today, still pursuing this research. I mean, very early in my career, I became faculty in the department um, about two years ago. And so, um, yeah, just new here, but trying to do the important work that Kathleen and Susan have started. So that's me. Good story. Great. That's great. Yeah, there's a lot of ways you can study nutrition. That's <laughs> you really have to find your niche. Um, that's fantastic. So that's a perfect lead in. Um, we're going to start off with a paper um, from 2022 Journal of Nutrition, um, where it is bringing together all of the things, DHA, pregnancy, and lots of measurements that you guys get to hopefully um, bring to the lay person ourselves. We are the lay people. Um, so this study, this paper is called DHA supplementation during pregnancy enhances maternal vaguely mediated cardiac autonomic control in humans. That's the one we want to start with. It's a mouthful. <laughs> Can you guys set the stage? What was the study and what was the rationale behind it? Yeah. So this is a basically a secondary analysis of the parent trial. And in the parent trial, our, our uh, primary outcome measures were uh, fetal neurodevelopment, where we used uh, heart rate variability uh, metrics um, to analyze their neurodevelopment. And then we also looked at the relationship between maternal DHA and fetal DHA. So that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a separate paper. Mm -hmm. But what led us up to this was um, in our previous trial, uh, the preliminary work that led to this. It was a small R21. We only had 40 some women in it. And we just didn't have enough power to look at um, the effect of DHA in pregnancy in pregnant women. Mm -hmm. There have been lots of studies using DHA in adults that shows that it lowers heart rate and improves heart rate variability. But there just has been no work in pregnant women. So uh, this gave us the PANDA study is the one that gave us the power to look at the effect in pregnant women. Mm -hmm. So um, when we talk about heart rate var variability, we're really talking about a um, sort of a proxy for, for general proxy for good health and well-being in, in, uh, in adults and in, in people. So we're looking at autonomic balance. And um, how do you, you know, describe heart rate variability? <laughs> how do I describe? Well, there's different, there's so many different metrics. And there's the standardized clinical metrics that mer uh, measure short term and and uh, overall heart rate variability, and then uh, but there's lots of different metrics. There's time domain metrics, frequency domain metrics, nonlinear metrics. There's some some of the nonlinear metrics are especially interesting because they look at like the, the complexity of a signal, you know. Mm -hmm. So so we use a combination, in the fetus, we use a combination of these uh, measures to come up with what we call the fetal autonomic brain age score. And that was developed by uh, colleagues in Germany that we partnered with um, to an analyze the, the fetal data. Mm -hmm. I have a quick the, question yeah, sure, about heart, sure. just like to set the heart rate variability. Mm. Uh, is it correct to say the same as in adults where generally you want a higher amount of variability is better. So like if an adult's running and their heart rate is up and then you want it to drop very quickly back to kind of baseline, that's a sign of a, a well-functioning heart. Yeah. But if it doesn't yeah. change very much, then yeah. Yeah, things aren't, is that kind of right? Or is that it, too simplified? 
No, I don't think it's too simplified. What you want is a flexible system. You right, want a, yeah. a system that adapts, a system that's flexible, that can respond to whatever external or internal um, mechanisms mm -hmm. there are. So you want to see, so high variability is good up to a point. You know? Right. <laughs> Everything's good up to <laughs> a point. <Exactly. laughs> and and uh, I, I tend to think in systems, like systems mm -hmm. analysis. So when I think of a fetus, I think of a developing system, right? And you've got all these um, mechanisms that come together that regulate breathing and digestion and brain function and, and motor movement and all these types of things, right? And mm -hmm. they all have to work together. So um, you have all these subsystems that have to come online and function normally. And so when we measure uh, heart rate variability, we are measuring the variability between the beats of the heart, but that's influenced by many things, including all the things I just mentioned, mm -hmm. <laughs> infection, brain function, even the microbiome is, is uh, there's some talk about, you know, the, the gut influencing vagal response of course and it does. communication with the brain. So, <laughs> so I think of this as a system that's coming online and we're measuring the function of the system. Mm -hmm. And then the system, you know, matures and peaks, you know, and then as we get old and start to unravel our systems unravel <laughs> until we're completely unraveled and dead so yeah. <laughs> heart, you know heart rate variability decreases with time mm. and age and uh and at towards the end of life it's you know what can i say yeah we're all going downhill <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> danielle and danielle and tina are peaking and bill and i are <laughs> on the same ride i feel like i'm downhill now too <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yes. Um, yeah. So you guys are, are looking at this dynamic system, which mm -hmm. is really interesting. Um, so can you describe, you talked about heart rate variability. Can you describe vagal tone now and what that means? How it's, is that? Yeah. Very simply put vagal tone yeah. is, is a uh, link to uh, respiration. You know, most mm -hmm. of the, most of the measures are dependent on, on the respiratory rate. Uh, but vagal tone is basically, uh, gosh, sometimes it's so simple, it's hard to describe, mm -hmm. but it's just basically the, so. What is the vagus? Yeah, right. what is the, the vagus yeah. is, is go, the main, go basic, super, the, va the, va the super highway of the nervous system that runs, mm -hmm. you know, pretty controls multiple systems, uh, pupillary constriction, uh, swallowing, breathing. Uh, gut mm -hmm. function, all those types of things. So it, it gets a lot of input from, it runs the entire length of the body. It gets input from all these different um, um, organs and, and works together, right? Mm -hmm. So a person with high vagal tone um, would have, uh, well, let's look at it this way. On the one hand, so you, if you're looking at the autonomic nervous system, you're thinking about uh, two branches, the sympathetic branch and the parasympathetic branch, and the vagus is the parasympathetic branch. Mm -hmm. And they have, they work together. There's no good or bad here. Um, they just work together and they should be fairly well balanced. So if you're in a situation where uh, you need, you know, you're in the woods and you run across a bear and he starts running towards you, you need to be able to run. And so your sympathetic system will kick in and you'll start running and your heart will beat faster and pump more uh, blood around and you'll breathe faster and everything works great. But then when that stress is over, you want to be able to slow all that down. And that's where the vagus comes in. It also comes in like, let's say you're concentrating on something like a sharpshooter, you know, who's doing cross country skiing, for example, and then they come across their target and they have to calm down and shoot and focus and hit the target. So mm -hmm. that's where a flexible system is useful. Uh, think about the infant in SIDS. So for example, um, there's some implication that there's an autonomic uh, dysfunction in, in uh, SIDS deaths. Mm -hmm. And so um, you, uh, the system has to be able to arouse and recover. So in the case where there's low oxygen, you know, maybe the baby would roll over and, and then, you know, resuscitate where in some cases they don't. So, so mm -hmm. there's, there's serious, you know, it has a, a function and it mm -hmm. has a, a recovery function and it plays roles in, everything from fighting infection to everyday life to cognitive, you know, functions. So yeah, yeah. kind of covers it. I hope pretty big. <laughs> yeah. 
pretty yeah, so, big areas. But, so but, nutrition can influence vagal tone? I think so. Yes. <laughs> Okay, we got a yes and an I think so. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. I knew me here anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I, I would think so, especially with omega 3s. And one thing I wanted to point out about pregnancy so, this is really the important part of the study is that when you're talking about an adaptable system, so we have um, dramatic changes in the pregnant body. So, dramatic cardiovascular changes, metabolic changes, and these change across the course of gestation. So as gestation is prolonged, these changes are more uh, dramatic. And what happens normally in pregnancy is there's a shift towards more sympathetic balance. So a pregnant woman's heart rate will be faster, her variability will be slightly lower. Um, mm -hmm. And then if you add on to these things, and if you'd like to read a uh, Bruce McEwen's work on allostatic load, that's a, that's a great primer for all of this. But alis, the concept of allostatic load and weathering are uh, two important mm -hmm. concepts here. So we have a, a functioning, healthy person, and they become pregnant, and their heart rate variability will decrease, and their heart rate goes up. And this is a normal adaptation. They become mm -hmm. slightly insulin resistant. Again, a normal adaptation. So if you have a flexible system that's healthy, then you should be able to get through that pregnancy with no big deal. But if you have an unhealthy system and you're entering pregnancy with uh, some of these um, uh, stressors, like maternal obesity, economic insecurity, uh, these can be external or internal stressors, um, just general poor health, poor nutrition, then you're just adding on to this load and then you add pregnancy to that. And this is where having a healthy heart rate variability uh, mm -hmm. becomes more important. And, and so that's why we're excited about the role of DHA um, showing this, this influence and specifically on uh, vaguely mediated metrics, which Shouldn't have been a surprise to me, but I was uh, surprised that it actually turned out that way. I mean, that's what you would expect, but since when do you get what you expect, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, you get so scarred in research. But yeah, right. So how, how exactly did you got, did you do the study? What was the design and conduct? Um, Danielle, I'm talking too much. You want to take yeah, that? You're doing a great job. Sure, I can. I can take that easy question. So the panda study was two arms. We had an 800 milligram group and a 200 milligram group of DHA per day. Mm -hmm. And so women were randomized to receive either 800 milligrams or 200 milligrams at 12 to 20 weeks gestation throughout their pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And we followed the moms throughout their pregnancy and then the babies throughout the first year of life. Um, in pregnancy, the two electrophysiological physiological measures that we collected were at 32 weeks and 36 weeks gestation. Mm -hmm. And so we brought women into the lab at Hoagland Biomedical Imaging Center, and we had them do um, biomagnetometry. So they sat in a fetal biomagnetometer. It's mm -hmm. a giant device that fits over the maternal abdomen um, mm -hmm. that measures all of the electrical signals that are naturally emitted from mom and baby simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And I, Kathleen can probably geek out on the um, the <laughs> physics and the physiology there, but, um, essentially it allowed us to collect maternal heart rate and fetal heart rate simultaneously during these 30 minute, um, data collection procedures. And so we did that, like I said, at two points during pregnancy, and that's the data that we used for the study that Kathleen was just referencing, where we found that there was a difference in maternal heart rate and maternal heart rate variability between the 800 milligram group and the 200 milligram group, mm -hmm. where the women who got the 800 milligram group had lower heart rate and higher variability compared to the women who got the 200 milligram dose. And that's controlling for dietary intake, maternal weight, and things that we know that also affect heart rate variability. So we were really excited about this. Mm -hmm. oh. and, so, and that's indicative of that more flexible system uh, able to, to switch between sympathetic, parasympathetic a little bit easier. And so that's how that all comes together. That's fascinating. I also thought it was really interesting how you guys did talk about and couch the study in the fact that the system's supposed to change. It's naturally changing. It's, you know, it has to, cause it's adapting to pregnancy. And so what you're looking for is 
um, basically the, the, the control group is going to go on this trajectory and you're looking at the difference um, with the higher DHA group instead of, it, it's just like, it's a really interesting way I feel like to look at data and to, it, it's harder to explain and get out, but I feel like you guys did a really good job in the paper. For how, me did affect, how did it affect the babies? Yeah, so that was interesting. So <laughs> the study that led up to this, we we had two groups in that study and we gave women, pregnant women, 600 milligrams of DHA or a placebo, so no supplement. Um, now the interesting difference between that study, what was called HOPE, uh, and this study was that the women who entered the PANDA study uh, had a higher DHA status when they entered and then we didn't use a placebo. So we didn't see any difference in, in the fetuses uh, in our primary outcome measure. But that's explained better when Danielle gets into her egg nutrition paper. So, mm -hmm. so that was a, a, a little bit disappointing, but not terribly surprising. We did see a difference in neurodevelopment when we did a second, uh, uh, after we collected the HOPE data, we went back uh, once we developed this FABOS tool with the German group and we sent them our HOPE data. And uh, so they did see a difference in the FABOS in the, in the babies that were in the HOPE trial or in the fetuses that were in the HOPE trial. So it's a fetal measure. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was greater, so that's what sparked us to do it in this study. But we just didn't feel right about knowing what we knew. Um, we didn't feel right about using a placebo Oh, right in, in, the, in the second follow up in the set in the follow up in panda so mm -hmm. we we wanted to supply we didn't think that 200 milligrams was enough frankly mm -hmm. and um why why there, would anybody think that's enough yeah so so that's the kind of the over over the counter dose and and uh mm -hmm. given how low the dha was in our previous trial it just it just wasn't enough we didn't think so anyway so we gave uh, the over-the-counter dose and compared that to 800. So. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you, saw, you saw differences in infant outcomes in Panda too? Uh, no, we did not. We did so not. we measured, no, well, I take that back. So yes and no. <laughs> and <laughs> so in the, in, the, in the parent trial, we only looked at fetal autonomic neurodevelopment and uh, equilibrium between mom and baby. Yeah. And, and so in other words, like was mom supplying enough DHA to her fetus if we use e equilibrium between mom and baby as a, as a sort of index of, of uh, mom has enough DHA for yeah. the baby. Mm -hmm. and, and so we did, we did see a difference. There was there, uh, the babies that were born, um, there was a higher incidence of equilibrium in the babies in the 800, if they were in the 800 milligram group. Um, but it didn't affect the uh, neurodevelopmental score. There was no difference in that. Mm -hmm. And can mm -hmm. you unpack that equilibrium thing again? Oh, I was afraid you would. Yeah, no, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. So the, the, uh, there was a, I think it's a Dutch group that published mm -hmm. some work on, on um, what they call equilibrium. So the, the concept is, is that if mom has adequate DHA stores, that cross the placenta, the fetus should have DHA equal to mom or, or, or maybe even less. For example, maybe it didn't need as much, so it didn't take as much from mom. And that's a big stretch, okay? It, it's not quite, it's not that simple. Yeah. And I'm not a fatty acid person, and even I know that it can't possibly be that simple. Mm -hmm. um, but I was reading a paper by Sheila Innes, and, and something in it made me think that this was a a reasonable concept that maybe women didn't have enough to supply um, their infants. And that was certainly true in our first study where equilibrium did never, it never occurred in the placebo group and it only occurred in 35% of the women in the uh, supplemented group. And how do you measure it? Um, you just measure uh, red blood cell DHA, uh, cord blood, and then compare that to maternal red blood cell at delivery. Oh, and if it's the same Yeah, value. if it's the same or if the, if the newborn is a little bit less, leaving mom with some reserve. 
um, this kind of makes sense. If mom's going to breastfeed, she's got some reserves. So in other words, the fetus isn't drawing down mom's stores and it leaves her with an inadequate supply uh, for breastfeeding and, and which the brain, the, the infant brain will take up more DHA during breastfeeding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. women are sort of a baseline for people, women that are not supplementing with DHA would be a negative balance in a sense. Yeah. Yeah, in a sense. Equilibrium yeah. Yeah. And okay. so the, the Dutch group, they said, you know, 6% DHA, red blood cell DHA, or, or whichever measure they use, 6% uh, was sort of the threshold where you, you just don't achieve equilibrium. That it's just okay. not going to happen. Okay. In our previous study, I think women were entering the, the, the trial at something like 4%. Mm -hmm. Okay. In this current study, it's more like 7%. Yeah. But one thing we did find is that the women that had uh, at delivery who had DHA less than 6%, just like the Dutch group found, um, they nobody below 6% achieved equilibrium with the fetus. And then, um, and then the 800 milligram group, there were more cases where the mother-infant pair achieved equilibrium. And mm. that and that was significantly higher in the 800 milligram group. So we accomplished mm -hmm. that. But the end, when we looked at the results, like uh, we looked at it by, by group, and then we looked at those that achieved equilibrium and those that did not, it didn't make any difference in the neurodevelopmental mm -hmm. outcome for the fetus. So it was, an interesting, um, it was an interesting measure, and it does show that 6% is too low. And I think a lot of Susan's work has also shown that 6% is sort of the threshold where, where um, you know, you're increasing your risk of preterm birth and those types of things. Yeah. And just to clarify the, the percentage, the, the values that are, that you guys get at your lab are a little different than ours. So right. 6%, I think is around 5% for us. Mm -hmm. And this is part of the whole thing. We're trying to standardize how exactly the percentages, but same idea of, I mean, it's with so many things of once you hit a threshold, it might be harder to show an effect with a higher and higher dose. Once women, if women are below that threshold, you see more dramatic effects. And that to me is kind of hope versus Panda in yeah. some respects is that yeah. the women were in a greater need for DHA. And so you do see exactly you know, more, it's easier to see results in research. Right. And that's it. That's the, that's the important concept here. We're not, we're now out there to supplement DHA to women who don't need it. There's no point mm -hmm. in this, you know, we, we already, right. we know that let's, mm -hmm. <laughs> let's focus on on getting it into people who need it and health yeah. disparities and yes. economic insecurity and those types of things. So, yeah. Yeah. Cause we do, there is a relationship between DHA and socioeconomic status as well. Exactly. It all gets all mix, mixed up. So um, Danielle, let's, let's keep moving on to the egg paper. Cause this starts to bring together DHA and some other nutrients. The egg I also thought was interesting because the early, it wasn't the hope, but it was kudos. They used DHA enriched eggs, right? At KU? Yes. No, not kudos. Not kudos. Was, yeah. It was another egg study that. It's uh, just a different egg study. Yeah. Okay. Different egg study. <laughs> but I just like, when I think about pregnancy and women and eating fish, there's a lot of issues around that either. I mean, around the worries about, about mercury, worries about food safety, and then also just taste like some people, it's just not going to happen. So I like the supplementation option, but I also really love an egg because it does have, I mean, it's typically pretty well tolerated by a lot of people. It can get fairly enriched in DHA before tasting fishy. And then you get a whole, you get choline and lut lutein and xanth, like so many important nutrients that Danielle, I want you to talk about the next paper which is called intake of eggs, choline, lutein, zeaxanthin, and DHA during pregnancy and the relationship to fetal development. So let's go there. Yeah. What was the study? Yeah, yeah. So this is another secondary analysis of PANDA. So it is the same women, the same babies. I think it's important to point that out. We have a lot of papers now coming out on PANDA and ADORE data, which is Susan Carlson's large multi-site DHA supplement supplementation trial. Um, but because I'm a nutrition scientist and I always have my nutrition hat on, I knew because I was the one who administered uh, food frequency questionnaires during pregnancy. So we had all of this data um, about what women were eating while they were pregnant. 
Um, and I wanted to look at that. I wanted to look at that a little bit deeper. And so um, we have two different measures, two different food frequency questionnaires. So the first one was our DHA FFQ. That's what we call it. The DHA mm -hmm. food frequency questionnaire. It's seven questions. I think we're maybe going to talk about that a little bit later today, but mm -hmm. one of the questions is about egg intake. And for the reasons that you just mentioned, I was like, let's look at how eggs, how just egg intake, a simple food could be related to some of the measures of fetal neurodevelopment. Um, and then also we did uh, what's called the DHQ FFQ. Um, so that is a diet history questionnaire that has been used in many, many clinical trials now. Um, and it, it's a more overall assessment of diet. And so we collected that food frequency questionnaire in the beginning of the study. So we tried to capture pre-pregnancy diet. And then we also administered the same, a very similar questionnaire during pregnancy at 32 weeks, capturing sort of a pregnancy diet. And so because we had collected both a measure of pre-pregnancy diet and diet during pregnancy, um, I just like couldn't resist looking at some of the nutrients and how they could affect neurodevelopment. Um, and then I was specifically interested in those nutrients that we know to be neuroprotective in other research. So DHA, of course, that's sort of our bread and butter here in the lab. I was also interested in choline and the carotenoids you mentioned, lutein and zeaxanthin. And then because nutrients outside of supplements, like you mentioned, don't exist in isolation. I mean, we're eating foods. I was like, let's take a look at eggs. Um, and so when we did all these analyses, again, it was a secondary analysis, we found that maternal egg intake was associated with um, vaguely mediated fetal heart rate variability. And so that's RMSSD. That's one of the metrics that we measured in um, Panda. Mm -hmm. We also found that egg intake was associated with the fetal autonomic brain age score, which Kathleen referred to earlier, the FA boss score um, at 36 weeks gestation. So we got really excited, like egg intake alone is associated, even though we didn't find a relationship with just DHA, we're finding a relationship with this food. Like how cool is that? And then we wanted to look at not just eggs, but we wanted to look at the nutrients that I just mentioned, DHA, choline, lutein, zeaxanthin, and how they could potentially act synergistically. And when we did that, we found that there was also association between these measures, these nutrients, and these measures of fetal neurodevelopment throughout gestation. Mm -hmm. And so um, when you're saying yeah. there's these associations, can you say which direction they're going? Is it more yeah. eggs and a better? <laughs> yeah, yeah. More mm -hmm. eggs was better fetal neurodevelopment scores. Yeah it gets a little messier when you're looking at multiple interactions. So yeah. when we looked at interactions yeah. between choline, DHA, lutein, and zeaxanthin, that's a four-way interaction. And that is too much for anyone to wrap their head around mm -hmm. in terms of like the beta. It doesn't tell us the direction of the beta. doesn't tell us anything about the direction of the relationship. It just mm -hmm. tells us there is a relationship. Okay. So I think, I think we really need to do some, some more work here to figure out how these things are interacting and what the relationships look like. Um, but yeah. So, so the, the, these were not DHA enriched eggs, mm -mm. No. regular eggs. Okay. Number two, when you start about Zia's and the, the carotenoids and choline, you're talking about total dietary or egg, egg derived zeaxanthin choline. Yeah. So we did one analysis that was just eggs mm -hmm. alone. And then we did one analysis looking at whole diet, DHA, choline, zeaxanthin, and lutein. Okay. And was there a difference in? Both models showed an effect. Okay. So most of the, I don't know what percent of the carotenoids in the diet come from eggs. Yeah. Or uh, I don't know the answer diet. to that question. Um, Is it probably quite a bit. Um, I mean, probably. I think that's fair. Okay. Okay. All right, interesting. And when you say neurodevelopmental outcomes, mm -hmm. could you be a little more specific? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> can you break that one down a little bit? So I'm talking about the fetal heart rate variability and okay. the fetal autonomic brain age score. And, that's and Abbas, Abbas that. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Unpack that. The brain age score? Yeah. yeah. Kathleen, I'll let you take that. That's <laughs> yeah. The, the uh, German, our German um, colleagues created so, this. Yeah. So the score itself is, is 
the output of the score is gestational age. So the, the using these metrics, and, and there's a, a lot of the metrics are the complexity metrics, so it's not just standardized heart rate variability. They use a combination of these metrics and the output, uh, and then they correlate that to gestational age. Uh, maybe correlation isn't the right word, but, but um, so when they develop the tool, they, yeah, maybe it is correlation. Oh, anyway, there's a, whole, there's a whole series of papers on how this tool was developed, but ultimately the end result was, was what they called a score. So it's a, it's a comprehensive tool, but it uses the inputs, our heart rate variability, and then you get a, a score of the gestational age. So, um, so yeah, that's basically that's it. Why, it just why, predicts why, gestational age. And so if the so fetus... You, so if the okay. fetus is 32 weeks and the score is 32 weeks, then, then you know the fetus is on track for neurodevelopment. If the score is 28 um, weeks and the fetus is 38 weeks, uh, then, then that's a low score. See what I mean? I see what you mean. And, and it leads, presumably gestational age rate relates to brain age. Exactly. That's, exactly. That's implicit. Yeah. Okay. Because, because fetal heart rate variability changes across the course of gestation. You know, but before 32 weeks, there is, there's basically no variability. Things aren't wired up properly yet. But after, when the sleep states start to emerge and the brain starts to develop, um, then you'll start seeing changes in variability. So you use those changes to, to calculate your score. Do babies sleep in vitro, in, in utero? It's, they call it sleep, brain, quiet brain. sleep. Yeah, it's, they do have REM sleep. So yes, they do. Okay. What yeah. what is what is um heart rate variability measured at one and two days of age tell you? It's just as useful. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me put it that way. Now you can't measure it across just you can't track at a track right. this variability across gestation, but it is it is useful. When we so this biomagnetometer is a pretty rare thing. There's only two in the United States, and we have oh one. Oh my gosh! Oh wow! Yeah, gosh. and and the beauty of this is that we don't have to put anything on the body. We, the woman just sits in front of it. We record the magnetic huh. fields that come from her heart and the baby's heart. But in order to use this tool, we had to spend at least five years characterizing the signals we got from it. So, so mm -hmm. we characterize fetal diaphragmatic movements that produces a, a very distinct uh, sinusoidal wave when the fetus is practicing breathing and they modulate their heart rate around this, this breathing, just like an adult would with respiratory sinus arrhythmia. But in the fetus, it's periodic breathing. So it comes and goes and you can see their heart rate variability change when they're practicing these breathing. They also do this around non-nutritive suck. So the fetus will suck and swallow amniotic fluid and practice that sucking motion. Again, another developmental mm -hmm. requirement so that the baby can come out and eat, you know, normally have a strong suck swallow reflex. And the same with REM eye movements, that will change heart rate variability too. So we had to characterize all of these signals uh, hiccups was another one we characterized because oh. the heart rate variability changes around that too. So once we mm -hmm. had all these things and waveforms identified and characterized, um, then that helps that helps us track neurodevelopment as well. That is wow. awesome. Wow. We are, and we also like the the. Did you want to say something? I was just going to talk about Colleen. Go ahead. <laughs> um, we did some work with the group at Cornell that studied Corne the Marie Cottles group, and they found that um, same dose of DHA, but higher choline, it, it caused a higher um, red blood cell DHA incorporation throughout pregnancy, which is the first time I think we've seen a di totally different nutrient change the, the response to DHA. Uh, and it is during pregnancy. This is not necessarily tested just in anybody. So right. um, that egg choline eggs is, eggs are a huge source for choline in pregnancy and it's also i think mentioned in here not usually in prenatal supplements yeah and we know dha is relying on phosphatidylcholine in order to get yeah. into the fetal brain so right. the two are clearly acting together mm -hmm. and so i love yeah. the idea of two nutrients kind of working together to produce optimal outcomes yeah and unfortunately two ones that are not in a standard prenatal. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, taking that to the 
to the masses, what, what do you recommend to women that they eat more eggs and take DHA? I mean, they're <laughs> pregnant. Yeah. I, well, Kathleen, do you want? I just to say, so I was driving to work one day and I thought, gosh, all this work 20 years later, what are we going to tell people? Eat right and exercise. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, we're right back to that. that. It's yeah. so true. Yeah. But I, I, I know it's much deeper than that, is deeper than that. And there's a lot of things that have to happen. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually writing a paper right now for a family practice journal on prenatal nutrition and neurodevelopment, trying to write it for yeah. a clinician. Mm -hmm. And I've created a handout that I hope that they will give to their patients that's highlights different foods to eat because so often we're telling pregnant women what not to eat. Mm -hmm. And there's some good research, qualitative research showing that women are just confused. They, they don't know. They don't know what to eat during pregnancy. They just know they shouldn't eat fish. <laughs> yeah. um, and so, yeah, I think <laughs> I am not a dietitian or a public yeah. health expert by any means, but I think this research certainly points to the fact that recommending simple foods like eggs mm -hmm. or seafood, if they can tolerate it. Mm -hmm. And if not take a DHA supplement mm -hmm. is like a really simple message that we could share in the clinic. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, absolutely. That's it. I mean, fish are such an amazing package of nutrients for pregnancy. It's kind of wild. And the fact that they've been, I mean, it's ironic and sad how vilified, vilified that got. And it was, I mean, it was really based on research around pilot whale blubber being 20x and it and it bled into the whole anything from the ocean and caused it's like telephone it's like well don't eat these fish but then it just kind of came into like well just i'm not going to bother eating fish it could be bad when it's like actually not eating any fish completely eliminates omega-3s from your diet unless you supplement because it's only yeah. EP and dh are only found in fish so it's kind of a natural experiment going on, but it does also and show this is a nutrient of need that is missing in the diet of a lot of women. Um, and in pregnancy, what's great is you can also see these kind of immediate effects, even starting supplementation in the, the beginning slash middle of pregnancy. You don't have to be, it's not like folic acid, where if you don't have it on board at the very beginning, then that you kind of miss your boat. It's like, you can kind of do a, a, a saving dose of higher dose of DHA throughout the second half. But we also see that coming into pregnancy, like all of the research is showing that baseline level of DHA, that alone predicts outcomes, where if you're higher, the outcomes are typically better, especially with preterm birth. And if you're lower, that's where that higher dose, thousand milligrams of DHA, 800 are really needed to, to kind of catch up. Um, so let's go to our last paper, which is very implementation focused. So KU Med has like so much of this great research and you guys want to get it going. How do we get this happening in the clinic and testing questionnaires? There's all different ways that we can try and assess DHA status. So please talk to us about your, your last paper, the utility of a seven question online screener for DHA intake and how it's being used clinically. Yeah. So again, credit to Susan Carlson, because I think in the final stages of her career, she has really been a champion of, okay, we know DHA mm -hmm. is beneficial. Let's get the information out to the masses. And so we've been working together as a team to try and share the good news about DHA supplementation in a clinical setting. And one way that we're trying to do that is by using the seven question food frequency questionnaire. Um, so both Panda and the Adore study used the seven question um, questionnaire about DHA intake. So we had a huge data set of people who had already completed this questionnaire. And we found that it was highly correlated with blood levels of DHA. So what they were reporting on this very simple questionnaire was almost as good as measuring their blood levels. Um, not as good and definitely not as good for research purposes. Um, I will say that I think it's really important to still measure blood levels of DHA in um, research. Um, but we thought 
Okay, so let's look at how this questionnaire predicts or is related to early preterm birth. And we found women who consume a report consuming less than 150 milligrams of DHA early in pregnancy have a higher risk of early preterm birth. Mm -hmm. um, and then to go beyond that, the women that are reporting low le levels of intake in early pregnancy are unfortunately also less likely to be adherent to our supplementation, um, intervention. And so it's this multifaceted problem, but hmm. we have taken that questionnaire now and we have started using it in the OB clinic at KU medical center. And so we have a sort of an OB champion there, Dr. Jean Lee, who has allowed us to use this questionnaire with all new OB patients. So it's a part of their intake forms. They get a link to a red cap survey. Mm -hmm. And so now we are building this huge data set of uh, DHA food frequency questionnaire so that we can try to understand the landscape of, of DHA intake in early pregnancy. And then um, also we've just started sending out a follow-up questionnaire asking, after you've completed the seven question questionnaire, did your provider talk to you about DHA? Okay. Um, how much did they recommend you take? And unfortunately our data right now and this is a project that is in process, but it's showing that the women who report low intake, only about 35% are hearing anything from their provider about DHA. Mm -hmm. And we had, I think four, or we've had four or five early preterm births in this data set now, and none of them reported hearing from their provider and they all had low DHA intake. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, come on. Well, but this is great wow. study this to do. Great data. Mm -hmm. You've got approval from all these women to follow up um, mm -hmm. after as, as a research cohort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's actually quality mm -hmm. improvement. So it's not technically research. So because it's happening up in the clinic, it's considered quality improvement. So um, that's been fun to learn how that works. But you can publish quality improvement. Mm -hmm. Totally. Stories. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Studies. Yeah. Very yeah. interesting. That's and fantastic. Yeah, that is, I mean, it's fantastic. And it, it sounds very real. Like yeah. this, of course, is happening. It's not implementation is a whole different ballgame than um the controlled setting of a research study. And so and like in our perfect world, we would we would have an RBC DHA test or a whole blood DHA test at the first visit where you do blood work. And then you would have the doctor would actually have a number to treat and you guys wonder, need the data. I wonder if they trust that number more than they trust the questionnaire. Would they, would they be more compelled to say something to the woman mm -hmm. if they had a lab slip with a number on it and a, you know, this is below normal aster, you know, yeah. red dots and things like that versus the question. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, the piece that we haven't done yet that we're, we're wanting to do is to do some pr provider education around this. Um, we yeah. hope to get some R01 funding to actually do some serious focus groups and figure out how to enroll only people who have low DHA intake according to this questionnaire and give them a high dose from the beginning and support them throughout their pregnancy. But mm -hmm. we're working on getting that funded. Cool. <laughs> yeah. And right. the other piece would be, could they give them like a prescription for a high quality high dose, because you say, go take a high dose supplement. And then you go to the grocery store and it's like a nightmare. It's so many options and confusion. Yeah. So to like, it'd almost be like a drug model of like you test, you have a treatment. It is just DHA or just EPA DHA and an appropriate dose. I mean, you guys have the dose tested. And if it could be like treated that way, to me, that feels like a lot less pressure on the mom to go do one more thing. Like, like you said, women are confused about what they have to eat and they feel a lot of pressure. And it's like, stress is not good. Extra stress around eating is not good. <laughs> and I feel like testing takes could take the stress off mom and just be like, we're gonna treat you for this low, low level of something. We'd love it if everybody, I mean, public health wise, we think fish need to be promoted a lot more. And just like most of the fish available are not super high in mercury, but for those low women who also you said are less likely to 
follow up, less likely to adhere to just a general, like you should go get a supplement. But if they're given something, it just takes yeah. one barrier out of the way. And that's what unfortunately, yeah, even if they're given it, what well, we found in our study, mm -hmm. we gave the supplement and it was still a struggle. So I think we have mm -hmm. more work to do there too. But that's yeah, true. it's, it's tricky. But I also, it, this is one of the only things now that, that is a treatment for more preventative for preterm birth. Yeah. And providers don't know that, unfortunately. No. Yeah, no. Education is, is what's missing here. Mm -hmm. And it, I think we've gotten to a pretty good place where the story is, like you said, Kathleen, it comes back. Nutrition is so complicated. And then it yeah. always comes back to like the simple stuff. Yeah. Eat, eat less, kind of maddening. Yeah. Yeah. You can take a minute. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. So fantastic. We are so uh, happy that you guys are still doing the work. I know Kathleen, you are retired and well-deserved. It sounds like you're still very busy. I, I stay, I try to stay involved. So I, I, yeah. uh, I'm still on as emeritus professor. So, yeah. so I can keep my finger yeah. in the DHA work. Uh, we're so. not letting her go. <laughs> <laughs> no. Kathleen and and never letting them go. <laughs> no, but it's great to have to like just meet the next generation and yeah. Um the kind of work that's being done at KU is is yeah. pretty and, extraordinary in this field, I think. So and I Thank I you. do want I do want to kind of uh, emphasize that any future trials with pregnant women you know, heart rate variability is very easy to record. I mean, it's just an EKG. That's all it is. You don't need a biomagnetometer to do what we did. It's very nice. It's very nice if you're doing fetal work, but uh, like Dr. Harris suggested, you can measure these things in the newborn too, and you can measure other things in the newborn. So what I'd like to see in these, in women who are enrolled in these studies is longer, longer duration recordings, mm -hmm. Uh, wearables, that would be excellent, uh, especially mm -hmm. if we could record heart rate variability during sleep, uh, that would be oh. even better. So there's a lot of opportunities here to, to get some in-depth studies yeah. at, I'm at a very on getting low those <laughs> Yeah. I, I want to do those studies, but yeah, others too. I mean, gosh, everyone do the research because yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of groups, uh, not a lot, but there's a few groups now that are really focusing on heart rate variability in pregnant women. What does this look like? What are the mm -hmm. individual differences? You know, so they're they're kind of cleaning up the field for the rest of us that want to look at at what things look like when they're not normal. Yeah. Right. And it's such a functional measure that intakes oh, yeah. so yeah. many things like but it's simple enough mm -hmm. exactly. to grasp. So exactly. We're glad you guys are doing all the really detailed work and then you can bring it back and we can mostly understand these really complicated, yeah. interesting systems. Yeah, I think uh, one of the most important things is, is that when we write these grants at the end, we always say we want to affect policy. And uh, I think we did. You know, mm -hmm. that makes me really happy that we actually accomplished this. So I think this work and future work and Susan's work, all of this is is working towards uh, healthcare policy. So. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Well, we've reached the end of our time um, and we've covered a lot. Thank you guys so much for joining us and we will keep an eye on you guys and keep watching what you do. Excellent. <laughs> Fun those <Thanks>. studies. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh